Portal, a franchise that many consider to be Valve's most innovative, unique, and essentially perfect venture. It's a series that over the course of only two games has managed to be recognized as one of the standout masterpieces in the entire gaming landscape, creating some of the most recognizable environments, imagery, and simply an atmosphere which is so simple yet so rich at the same time. But before we get too ahead of ourselves, let's take a step back and actually look to where the series roots began. As due to the nature of the gameplay which is included in these games, it's important to recognize where these ideas all stemmed from and how they went on to create the revolutionary impact they'd eventually end up causing. The journey towards Portal starts as a college project, specifically at DigiPen Institute of Technology. A group of student developers known as Nuclear Monkey Software were experimenting around with the idea of portals. This was to be the main mechanic in their project, going under the name Narbacular Drop. And if you're wondering, the title doesn't mean anything. It was simply a unique title they made to boost search results. You can still find downloads of this game online, and if you're a fan of the Portal games, I'd say it's worth trying out just to get a greater understanding of the series' roots. As you could assume, it's less of a game and more of a tech demo. The environments look bad, the character you play as is a fairy, and the camera's generally quite shoddy. But that doesn't matter, as witnessing the creation of the Portal mechanic is still something to behold. As we'll see later on, you'll notice that despite the Portal game seeming very different from this, they still make several callbacks and direct inclusions from this game. You start off in a cage, which is cleverly done to essentially force the player to learn the mechanics themselves. You are told all the controls beforehand, of course, in one of the most horrible instruction menus I've ever seen, but controls are often easily forgotten or just straight up ignored. The actual portal mechanic is of course not very fleshed out, but functions pretty much as you'd expect, just without any of the precision or style. Both mouse buttons create two separate portals, one being blue and the other being orange. When having both portals placed down, you'll then be able to enter one and come out on the other side. For instance, you place one portal on the ground and the other on the ceiling, and you could potentially create an endless loop. You can see why Valve, and particularly Robin Walker and Gabe Newell, were so intrigued by this little tech demo, as the potential for some incredibly solid and groundbreaking gameplay was immediately noticeable. So, as a result, the entire team were offered jobs at Valve to come and create a brand new IP all revolved around the portal mechanic featured in Narbacular Drop. From everything I've seen, Portal's development was mainly described as a tough but gratifying experience. The game's primary mechanic had already been carried out in the first experiment, so that had to just be recreated in the Source engine, with some additional changes and refinements which we'll see later on. A lot of decisions made during the development were not only clever, but also came out of necessity. It was made within the period of around two and a half years, with about ten people actually working on the game, and due to the heavy reuse of Half-Life 2 assets within the environments and props, the writers Eric Walpole and Chet Falishek coordinated with Mark Laidlaw, the writer of the Half-Life franchise, with the ultimate goal being to connect Portal to the pre-existing Half-Life universe, which would eventually end up creating quite impactful outcomes within the Half-Life 2 episodes. But even with the small team, Walpole claimed that without the constraints, Portal would not be as good a game. It seems like there was a sense of urgency throughout the production, almost like they were throwing ideas down, refining them as best they could, and then moving on. And it was on the 10th of October 2007 that Portal was finally released. Intense pain, so in case you don't make it through the testing, goodbye. Now that initial info dump was quite intense, so let's just focus on the game for a while. I honestly think Portal might be one of the most perfect games ever created. That's not to say it's my favourite, although it's definitely up there, but it's one of those rare instances where the experience which is presented appears so incredibly tight, concise, and intentional in every aspect. The intro to the game sets things up very well, not only calling back to Narbacular Drop with this holding cell we've been trapped in, but presenting us with a clinical and empty environment, apparently being inspired by films like the island. This is how things will appear throughout the entire game, creating one of the most desolate and isolating atmospheres in any game I've played, which is only reinforced even further when we get greeted by a robotic voice known as GLaDOS, who appears to be running the entire facility. Hello, and again, welcome to the Aperture Science Computer Aided Admission Center. We hope your brief detention in the relaxation vault has been a pleasant one. Your specimen has been processed, and we are now ready to begin the test proper. Before we start, however, keep in mind that although fun and learning are the primary goals of all enrichment center activities, 
Serious injuries may occur. For your own safety and the safety of others, please refrain from the important and genius thing the game does, however, is create these barren environments, whilst at the same time giving them so much life. The radio here is an excellent addition, juxtaposing what could be quite a freaky atmosphere, and in turn creating something charming that people could attach to straight away. You might forget when replaying the game, but it does take a short while to even get our hands on the portal gun, although this is purposely done to make us accustomed with some other integral mechanics in the game. We're shown straight away how the portals actually work, with two getting open opened up, once again with the distinct blue and orange colours, with our only way to progress being to enter the orange one, emerging out the other side of the room. We then get a simple yet effective puzzle, introducing us to cubes and buttons, which when you break the game down, is what a lot of the puzzles actually revolve around. The button opens up the door, and can both take the cube's weight and your own weight. The fact it can take your own weight will not only be used to your advantage, letting you place portals ahead of rooms you won't be able to access, and simply giving you a larger perspective of what you're dealing with, it can also be a disadvantage advantage, confusing certain puzzles, and making you question which buttons should have cubes placed on them, and which ones you should be standing on. And after you've solved the puzzle, you enter the elevator, or rather the chamber lock at the end of the room, transitioning us to the next stage. Pay attention to the sound design when using this thing. There's always something that I found so freaky about this sound. It's not entirely clear whether we're ascending or descending this facility, and despite the overall length of this game not being long at all, it gives this sense of being stuck in this endless cycle of solving puzzles and being tormented by this rogue AI. And talking of the sound design, let's just listen to how this game sounds when GLaDOS is silent and no music's playing. Due to the cultural relevance of this franchise, you may have been tricked into thinking it's funny and quirky and focused on deceitful cakes, but when you break it down, the overall ambience of this first game is incredibly stark, and some could even say haunting, especially with some of the musical tracks which are spread throughout this game. And I'm just going to put this out there. For me, Portal easily has one of the best soundtracks in any game I've ever played. It's not just down to how excellent all of these tracks sound, but in an actual game sense, due to how prevalent the silence is throughout this game, every time a track plays it's a startling and dare I say almost an enlightening moment on our journey. By the time we actually get our hands on the portal gun, we would have been made aware of several things, most of them simply being lodged into our minds and left unsaid. The elevators make us aware that all of these tests are taking place in Aperture Laboratories, a facility set up by Aperture Science to research and experiment with physics. Throughout the game, GLaDOS gives numerous pieces of insight about the company, fleshing out and vilifying what's pretty much an unknown organization. Well done. Remember, the Aperture Science Bring Your Daughter to Work Day is the perfect time to have her tested. This next test involves the Aperture Science Aerial Faith Plate. It was part of an initiative to investigate how well test subjects could solve problems when they were catapulted into space. Results were highly informative. They could not. Good luck. Much like Half-Life, despite the game focusing on quite a simple situation of solving puzzles, the lore of this series runs incredibly deep. The time period in which this game is set happens somewhere around 2010, occurring shortly after the Combine's invasion of Earth, which we see in Half-Life 2. But as we'll see primarily in the second game, this storyline ranges all the way back to the 1940s, chronicling the foundation and ultimate collapse of Aperture Science. I'll touch on the key elements later, but just know, this is one of those franchises which still has people discussing and theorizing 
theorizing about certain events to this day, and likely years to come. The environments of this game are handled expertly as well. You won't be getting any breathtaking vistas, but what you witness from the start of the game stays pretty consistent throughout. We'll see later on how these environments are purposely set up like this to have a distinct contrast later on in the game. But as I said earlier, the environment appears sterile and futuristic. White walls, neon signs, automatic doors and cameras. Your surroundings feel almost alien. But that would have been too easy for this game. Having some excellent and subtle environmental storytelling with the smallest details. Looking up close at these initially clean white walls, you'll notice there's a degree of dirt and scratches building up amongst all of them. And also in the elevator, we can clearly see the wear and tear of the foam padding surrounding us. Just with these little additions, it's conveying that despite our surroundings appearing futuristic, we've emerged at a time when they're starting to break down and aren't being taken care of anymore. Something else that surprised me was how long we're only given the one blue portal to use, taking 11 chambers before we manage to attain both the blue and orange portals. Even though the experience is rather short once you're familiar with the game, it's clear to see there was a strict priority to ease people into its mechanics. As we take the mechanic forward, one of the first things that you realize is this is a brand new mechanic that people don't really understand and you have to train them in a like train them with how the mechanic works and also train them with sufficient knowledge so they can use that mechanic to solve puzzles which is the core of the game you have to have certain sections of the game where you can be sure that the player has the knowledge that they need to progress so a lot of this is about uh, making sure that the levels you're designing are done in such a way that when the player finishes that level, they have that knowledge that you want them to have. Uh, this was a level in, uh, in Portal 1. Uh, it was pretty early on, uh, this level, and you can see the portals here, the, the blue portal here is moving on a timer. It moves from one to the next to the next. And the idea of this level was, by the time players solve this, they understand that I go in one portal and I come out the other. Right, that, that's the basic idea here. And I'd say they ace that with flying colors. When getting the portal gun, you'll immediately notice how unique its design is, as well as quickly becoming accustomed to its functionalities. As you could assume, its only function is to shoot two types of portals, although there's two electrical prongs at the end of the device, which now lets you pick things up using the device itself. There's of course a lot of information revolved around the gun and the portals themselves, but essentially all we need to know is that they can only be placed on the white colored concrete with any glass or dark colored materials metallic materials, preventing the formation of a portal. There's details like how portals were initially only meant to work with manufactured or refined moon rock. Now the beam counters told me we literally could not afford to buy seven dollars worth of moon rocks, much less 70 million. Bought them anyway. Ground them up, mixed them into a gel. Perhaps making us think if these walls in fact have that material baked into them. But all things considered, for most people, that's not really gonna matter. White means you can place a portal, dark means you can't. That's it. We can see the progression start increasing directly after we attain the portal gun, with the introduction of the energy pellets and energy pellet catchers. These will frequently reoccur throughout the game, and are once again ingeniously designed to essentially have optimum functionality. The energy ball gets fired out of a launcher, and in most instances will simply bounce back and forth, either between a wall or a ceiling until you move it somewhere. In this chamber, we can see exactly where it's going, and automatically have an orange portal placed for us. These always need to be guided to the catcher, which look fairly similar in appearance to the launcher. Some smart decisions have been made which solve some issues found in Narbacula Drop. For example, in the first stage of that game, you had to move a box onto a button, but the only issue was, the most likely way you were going to solve this while using portals was to place one portal on the ceiling above the button and another underneath the button itself. This was an issue, considering it was unclear exactly where the button was in relation to the ceiling, as the field of view simply didn't allow you the ability to see both. However, here, we can clearly see exactly where we need to place our other portal, due to the orange light which is being illuminated on the ceiling. This will be utilized to even greater effect throughout, simply creating an experience that has near to no annoyances or contrivances. In fact, we can see this right in the next chamber, having almost the exact same puzzle, but this time reversing where you need to place your portal. This tells us that not only do we have the ability to gauge where the catches are in relation to its reflective light, but also where the energy ball is going to hit due to the mark it leaves on the surface. But on top of that, this chamber also presents us with moving surfaces and how we'll have to occasionally time our movements. For a 
a first time player, you'd most likely recognise that the platform will be powered up by the energy ball. However, some forethought can be put in to save you time, by landing on the platform first, and then moving the energy ball to the catcher. Although most platforms move fairly slowly in this game, it makes particular sense here, considering it not only works as an easier way for newer players to land on it, but also as a punishment for those who aren't paying attention. Notice how you can only place a portal on the left hand side of the ceiling. It forces you to wait for this slow platform to move back, hopefully to instill more patience and consideration towards the actions you take in the future. As we'll see throughout the game, almost every chamber has this cause and effect style to it. You learned about platforms and timing in chamber 7, so in chamber 8, they give you the same task with a few more added steps, as well as having an actual threat of death. It's primarily the timing and multi-step aspects which get tested, making you play several portals to once again guide the energy ball. It's necessary to place these portals swiftly, as the energy ball only lasts for a certain amount of time, having its combustion be reset by entering one of your portals. Chamber 9 starts off with an excellent GLaDOS quote. The Enrichment Center regrets to inform you that this next test is impossible. Make no attempt to solve it. I could imagine people playing for the first time genuinely considering if she's telling the truth here, especially with how your cube can bust when trying to place it on the button. These are the material emancipation grids, and it's something you would have seen frequently up to this point after leaving each chamber. But in that instance, you would have only really noticed that your portal gun would shake when leaving. Essentially all these grids do is vaporize anything that isn't yourself or the portal gun. However, the other aspect you'll need to consider is that stepping through these also removes any portals you place prior to entering, which is why the gun shakes. It gets rebooted by the grid. This could present quite a challenge on your first playthrough, but teaches an important lesson, and that is to pay attention to your surroundings. I'm sure many people would try over and over to try bring the cube in at all different angles. However, once you use your portal to elevate yourself and the cube, we can clearly see there's a gap in the wall, letting us place a portal and take the cube in to the other side of the room. This is my only real issue with this game, and that's the fact that upon completing the game for a few, or maybe even your first time, you'll become accustomed not only to the game's mechanics, but maybe even the specific chamber's designs. Portal is one of my favourite games, and because it's quite short, I can imagine it's a game that I've completed considerably more times than most other games. So, as you could assume, replaying it for this video was a breeze. I knew exactly what I was doing and how the game ticks. I'll never quite get that feeling of discovery, or having that light bulb flick on in my head, because the light's been on ever since I completed it for the first time. It's unavoidable, and would only be fixed if every time you play the game, the levels have been completely rearranged with new ones. But the fact is, I think I would still call it an issue. I can replay the Call of Duty or GTA games, because even though I know the story, it's almost impossible for the gameplay to play out exactly the same way. It's just too dynamic. Portal obviously isn't trying to be Grand Theft Auto, but similar to games I really love, like Return of the Obra Dinn, every subsequent playthrough will be a lesser experience, at least for me, as it's less about discovering and more about recollecting what you previously did. For example, the next chamber. When you see a downward drop in a portal game, you immediately know speed and momentum is going to be the key to solving the room. To a new player, they might not have any idea, and discovering that you can move at this increased speed and launch yourself out of portals will be an incredibly exciting experience, and also something you can memorise and ponder over in upcoming chambers. I once again want to reinstate, there's nothing you can do about this. In my opinion, the only way you could create a puzzle game that keeps on giving would be to model its foundations on a jigsaw. You'll always know the outcome of a jigsaw. It's quite literally on the front of the box. The completed picture is used to guide you, but every time you make one, all the pieces are mixed up. After making it for the first time, it doesn't change how you approach it any subsequent time, as the pieces will never be presented to you in the exact same order. But that's completely fine for Portal's case. It chooses to sacrifice that for an interesting storyline and atmosphere, which, unlike the actual puzzles, I think does keep on giving, no matter how long you experience them for. Launching yourself using height and portals is also something that's introduced really well. Across the chamber, you're taught that depending on the speed you enter a portal, that same momentum carries over to when you exit out the other side. This does of course vary on the height you fall, which in the first game is the only way you can actually attain momentum. We see that falling through a portal on the floor without any actual drop, and emerging through an elevated portal, some momentum is actually garnered, but is incredibly minimal. Then we experience that from a slightly higher position, and the final part of the chamber 
uh, makes us go through two separate portals, quite clearly conveying that it's not only the speed you should be considering, but also the placement of your portals, and the distance they are from your destination. Finally, we reach chamber 11, where we attain the orange portal for our portal gun. Despite the previous chambers all developing on a soul idea, this chamber doesn't focus on the momentum idea which was just introduced, but instead gives us a trial run of how both your portals are going to be used. This chamber is once again based on timing, where you need to match up the point where the energy ball gets shot out in coordination with the automated revolving orange portal. This is when we can grab the gun, being replaced with a button we can push to open a door in front of us. Having this instantly pop up straight after we acquire the gun lodges this concept in our minds straight away and is particularly useful considering these kinds of time limited doors are used fairly frequently. As you could probably assume, the next couple chambers are primarily focused on getting you familiar with this new version of the portal gun and removing the expectation of having an orange portal automatically placed for you. In chamber 12, this is done by reintroducing the momentum aspect, not only making us directly cause this momentum ourselves by placing one portal on the floor and another from the highest position we can manage, but also focuses on the idea of traveling vertically, whereas the previous incarnation of this chamber was all about pushing ourselves forward as opposed to upwards. And in chamber 13, we reach what's essentially a culmination of ideas, using energy balls once again to power up a platform, using both portals to elevate ourselves to certain positions. It brings all the elements from the previous chambers and leaves us with a room where forethought, timing, and appropriate portal placement is key. And it's the switch between this chamber and the next one, which works as a great example of why I think this game is damn near perfect. After that culmination of ideas, this chamber switches things up again, including similar elements, with the ultimate goal still being to get the ball in the slot. But this time has you doing it over a noticeably larger area. And in many ways, the game gives you opportunities to complete these tasks faster. You could try platform over this dangerous water. I feel like how it's laid out almost tricks you into doing that, but you could also just put a portal on the other end and skip the entire thing. The increased scale can lead to some head scratching moments later in the game, as you've got to take into account elements like which portal you should actually use, consider if you'll need to quickly transport yourself to another position, and also if the ball will have enough energy to reach its destination. Chamber 15 is a room I could imagine stumped quite a lot of people with the reappearance of the emancipation grids. The most important thing you have to identify is that in many elements the game works with red herrings, just like a classic mystery. Having the two grids placed in front of the launcher and catcher makes you presume you'll need to complete this task on the outside, considering once we step over them, our portals will be wiped out. But it's simply a matter of timing once again, moving the energy ball further left, and then using our portals to slot it in from the inside. We get a lot of chances to fling ourselves in this level, which is something I think should have been used more in this game, simply because I think it's such a satisfying form of movement, and does genuinely give the sense of momentum, as opposed to a flat speed increase. Most of this chamber works on timing, not just around the energy balls, but also timing your portals correctly to make your way forward, and also timing button presses to open up a doorway to the catcher. The more I play this game, the more it feels like it has those same Half-Life sensibilities. They're obviously made by the same company, but I mean in the sense that there's never a dull moment. They're constantly introducing new things, and have designed their games in a way where they fine-tune the experiences to a T, letting you experiment around with things for what seems like the perfect amount of time, before they feel like they're overstaying their welcome. Chamber 16 is a great example of introducing new elements, not just in a gameplay sense, but a narrative sense too. Sentry turrets are scattered all around this area, which is something I've always been quite conflicted on. I think their personalities and design are great, even if it is artificial, it's the first intelligent piece of machinery we actually see, with GLaDOS's appearance being hidden throughout most of the game. The quotes some of these things give out are sometimes funny, but also freaky at the same time. Put me down, are you still there? But the actual implementation of these I always thought was a bit strange. They stand out as one of the only threats in the game outside of energy balls and toxic water, but I think it's actually generous even calling them a threat. There's of course no actual difficulty setting on this game, but the damage these guys give out quite literally feels like they're shooting peas at you. They can fire on you for a substantial amount of time and you'll be fine. They're at least never a nuisance, always being distinguishable from the bright red beam which shoots out the front of them, making you completely aware of where they are and also where they're aiming. But just like the turrets in Half-Life 2, all you need to do is tip these things over, which isn't difficult at all. I think if they were made to function more around the actual portals, and perhaps were slightly more deadly, I would have liked their inclusion more, because for the most part, you can just grab a cube, block all the incoming fire, and then knock them over. The story elements in this section are incredibly interesting, and also completely missable, but even if you do notice them, they go completely unsaid. This is the first instance where we witness some kind of outside force, which isn't GLaDOS. Someone's clearly been hiding 
happening behind the scenes, scrawling bizarre drawings and numbers on the walls, and repeating phrases like, the cake is a lie. I think the reason this stuff appears so interesting to me is because, as I mentioned, it goes completely unsaid. It feels like you've entered this area you're not supposed to be in, and it gives a further sense of unease as you progress forward. You don't know who or what did this, and more importantly, you don't know if this thing is your ally or your enemy. It's here where we also witness the environment completely change for the first time, working as some excellent symbolism for what these games are conveying. A futuristic, high-tech exterior being held up by this rustic and filthy interior. You could have speculated this for a while, especially with the lack of humans and GLaDOS's torment throughout the game, but this is the first time we actually physically see this darker underbelly. Chamber 17 introduces us to the well-known companion cube, something that's become beloved not just in the Portal community, but I'd say the overall gaming community in general. And I mean, your guess is as good as mine for why that is. It's a cube with a pink heart on it. Well, no, that's kind of a lie. It's actually the brilliant writing and the isolating atmosphere that's causing this. We've spent the entire game utterly alone, with recent details like the awareness that there are in fact other people floating around that we just haven't seen reinforcing this. But also, things like the frequent use of windows, all of which can't clearly be seen through, which can be identified as rooms which would have been used to observe test subjects, with no clear human figure appearing behind any of them. Although the cube itself is actually given more purpose in terms of its functionality. They emulate that Last of Us style of traversal, blocking your way forward, unless you boost yourself up on the cube itself to reach a higher position. It's also used to protect us from this unavoidable energy ball being shot towards us, and having us carry the cube around the entire chamber almost infers the idea that you're taking care of some kind of child or pet. There's several theories around what distinguishes this cube from the rest, with one idea even in intimating there's possibly a human inside this thing. Although the euthanizing process is remarkably painful, 8 out of 10 Aperture Science engineers believe that the companion cube is most likely incapable of feeling much pain. The Enrichment Center reminds you that the weighted companion cube cannot speak. The Enrichment Center reminds you that the weighted companion cube will never threaten to stab you and, in fact, cannot speak. In the event that the weighted companion cube does speak, the Enrichment Center urges you to disregard its advice. And of course, the most genius part of this level is that after tackling what is once again a step up from concepts that have already been introduced, you're blocked from going forward by GLaDOS, with the only way forward being to incinerate the cube. You did it. The weighted companion cube certainly brought you good luck. However, it cannot accompany you for the rest of the test and, unfortunately, must be euthanized. Please escort your companion cube to the Aperture Science Emergency Intelligence Incinerator. You euthanized your faithful companion cube more quickly than any test subject on record. Congratulations. This is both pretty dark and hilarious. We can presume the cube would have been destroyed anyway by the emancipation grid at the end of the level, but we're forced to incinerate the thing to fully detach ourselves from what could have been seen as a friend. And I need to reinstate. This is a cube with a heart on it, and you'll find a lot of people becoming disheartened and reluctant at throwing this thing in the fire. There's also another breach behind the chamber in this area, this one being particularly integral to the figure known as Doug Ratman. He's never implicitly mentioned in any of these games, but we'll talk about his relevance later on, as he's definitely one of the more bizarre characters in the Portal universe. In Chamber 18, we do arguably reach the culmination of all the ideas presented in the game. We start off elevating ourselves using momentum, stumbling across another rat den. The increasing prevalence of these within the last few stages works incredibly well in foreshadowing the events which are about to take place, as well as firmly lodging the idea in our heads that everything we've just experienced has essentially been one big ruse. The final room we reach, including turrets, is an incredibly well-designed puzzle, which does still occasionally stump me when returning to the game. The main thing you've got to realise this game excels at is the execution of every single concept it tries to tackle. It's got the restraint to not be overly ambitious. It's relying purely on the solid gameplay foundations it sets up from the beginning of the game. Everything is given time. It never feels like there's a good mechanic that wasn't used enough. Or, on the opposite side of things, a bad mechanic that's used too frequently. This final room basically packs everything into this tiny section. Turrets which need to be taken out with energy balls, which we've learned throughout the game 
game can be appropriately aimed judging by the markings they leave on the walls. Buttons which need to be pressed at correct times to activate platforms. Fast and efficient portal placement to launch ourselves. Eventually acquiring a cube, which unlocks the path to the exit. It's all so brilliantly done, and in such a straightforward and efficient manner. Chamber 19 is the final level, but is less to do with one cohesive puzzle, and more just one big set piece to round up the end of the game. It basically consists of a slow ride forward on a platform, where you quickly come to the realisation that you're being led to your death. The cake idea is reintroduced, with the wild cake is a lie scrawlings now being confirmed true, with the cake symbol here actually leading us to a fire pit. All aperture technologies remain safely operational up to 4000 degrees Kelvin. Best assured that there is absolutely no chance of a dangerous equipment malfunction prior to your victory incandescence. Thank you for participating in this aperture science computer aided enrichment activity. Goodbye. Using quick wits, we managed to escape out alive, taking us to just an unbelievable elevation to cap things off. We of course are now aware that GLaDOS is now actively trying to kill us, not just making fun. So as a result, we head completely behind the woodworks to hopefully find a way out. Now, despite this section arguably being my favourite in the entire game, keep this in mind when we look at Portal 2. The set piece here works very well, as the entire game is quite literally the opposite of this. And, in many ways, I suppose you could call most of the game quite a tranquil and peaceful experience. Almost everything in this section is focused on the atmosphere, navigating your way forward, and ultimately wrapping up the narrative. It's more focused on observing your surroundings and finding the correct way forward, as opposed to actual puzzle solving. We witness some spectacularly interesting things in this section though, such as the completely abandoned observation rooms that we've witnessed throughout the game, even being able to see the very first test chamber we solved. Tons of computers and servers scattered all around the place, with lots of illegible information coming up on screens. We were never being observed and tested by the Aperture organisation, but GLaDOS herself. There's signs painted on the walls, which is presumably leading us to an exit, and were once again most likely put there by Doug Ratman. We even get a small but impactful moment where we emerge back in a previous test chamber, and I think it's no mistake that this exact test chamber is the one GLaDOS claimed was apparently impossible, which we not only disproved back then, but almost instantaneously bypassed with the knowledge we've attained throughout our journey. Several factory rooms later, as well as a few scenarios where GLaDOS tries to ambush us with sentry turrets and a new rocket turret, and we eventually reach GLaDOS herself. I wouldn't say her reveal was particularly surprising, given her robotic sounding comments we've endured throughout the game, but her design is not only incredibly daunting, but somehow very memorable, even despite essentially being a collage of scrap and wires. GLaDOS as an antagonist is one of my all-time favourites. She's never really portrayed as a big bad villain, despite wanting you dead. It seems like she gets more satisfaction out of just throwing abuse at you, and watching you fail puzzles. The voice is clearly the most recognisable feature. Ellen McLean puts in a great performance, but without the vocal manipulation, I don't think it would have been anywhere near as indelible. As part of a previously mentioned required test protocol, we can no longer lie to you. When the testing is over, you will be Missed. There's such a huge impact to how twisted this character sounds. The design itself becomes even freakier under closer inspection too. There's been lots of speculation about what GLaDOS's figure was actually supposed to represent, but the two most frequent things I saw was that it was either supposed to be based off Aphrodite rising from the sea, or a bound and gagged woman hanging upside down. Now, the latter is definitely more terrifying, especially with the eerily accurate representations which have been drawn by fans. And from all the artwork I looked at, there wasn't any revolving around Aphrodite that looked even vaguely similar, although it could have just been used as inspiration of course. I personally haven't seen either of these be confirmed 100% by Valve, so I take it with a grain of salt. And even if it was confirmed, I think coming to your own conclusions might even result in some even more twisted and messed up interpretations for you to ponder on. This final boss fight is a great finale, taking down this evil AI that's been on your back the entire game. And I do like how this boss isn't revolved around using all the skills we've acquired. We already pretty much did that in some of the final tests chambers. So instead, it follows the trend that's permeated throughout the entire experience, and instead chooses to close the game off by focusing on the newest mechanic which was introduced, that being the rocket turret. We're shown how the fight's going to play out straight away, with one of her morality cores falling off her body, which we then need to place in the incinerator nearby. The switch in tone after we destroy this thing is both unnerving because of the quieter and more menacing voice, but then made comical because of the writing. That has got to be the dumbest thing that- Whoa, 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 whoa. Good news. I figured out what that thing you just incinerated did. 
It was a morality core they installed after I flooded the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin to make me stop flooding the enrichment center with a deadly neurotoxin. So get comfortable while I warm up the neurotoxin emitters. I think because of things like this, you'd have to call this a dark comedy puzzle game because it will make you laugh in one breath and in the next make you dreadfully unsettled. This starts a six minute timer while neurotoxin gets funneled into the room. This is when the rocket turret comes out the ground and all you need to do is use your portals to guide the missile to GLaDOS and then repeat the process of incinerating her cause. As we do this, we quite literally hear GLaDOS breaking down, with her only resort being to mock you as much as possible, maybe thinking it will break our spirit. All your other friends couldn't come either because you don't have any other friends because of how unlikable you are. It also says you were adopted, so that's funny too. It says so right here in your personnel file. Unlikable. Liked by no one. A bitter, unlikable loner whose passing shall not be mourned. As a boss, it's not the most amazing thing in the world, but definitely a satisfying conclusion. The original ending of this game simply had us being brought to the surface, having the rubble of GLaDOS raining down around us before fading to black. But an update which was put in on the run-up to Portal 2's release changed the ending very slightly, this time showing us being dragged away, presumably back into Aperture Science. And with one final surprise, showing us the apparently fictitious cake which looks damn tasty, and our trusty cube friend, the game comes to a close. And that is Portal, a game that I genuinely, genuinely think is perfect. It's not my favourite game, and it definitely won't be to everyone's tastes, but I've never quite experienced any other game that's this tight, innovative, and immersive. There's almost nothing that can drag this game down, which is something I can't even say about games I adore, like Metal Gear Solid 2 or Dark Souls. I think it all comes down to what Eric Walpole said about the constraints actually enhancing the game's development. They lay everything out on the table and create a game that is both concise, intriguing, engaging, and flawless. In my opinion, of course. Portal's release was of course met with widespread acclaim and notoriety. The amount of attention it got was surprising, as it appears even Valve was trying to prematurely boost its appearance to the public eye by packaging it with their unbelievably stellar Orange Box collection. But the fact is, it was an absolute hit with players, becoming easily one of Valve's most recognisable games alongside Half-Life, and being widely considered one of the greatest games ever made. There was extra DLC that was included with the Xbox Arcade release of this game, being known as Still Alive, named after the closing song of the base game. This included 14 new challenge maps, and despite being just as quality and thought out as the base game, the omission of GLaDOS does make the experience feel just that little bit more lifeless. These are challenge maps of course, they're made for people who want to experience as much as possible, and when looking at it from an outside perspective, it could have also just been Valve testing talent once again, with all these chambers being based on the Portal Flash version fan project. And of course, the most annoying part of this, it's still solely exclusive to the Xbox. Although, as you could assume, fans have recreated and directly ported every single map into the base game. It's just the fact you still can't buy it on PC, which is slightly frustrating. This takes us to Portal 2, released on April 18th, 2011. The development around this game is quite interesting, as it doesn't start as your typical case of simply trying to refine and improve on the original. They started working on this sequel almost straight away after the first game, which not only meant there was a majorly increased chance for both games to be more closely linked and have a steadier progression, but it also showed just how successful the first Portal was, with this second game being its own standalone release on both PC and consoles. For the first five months of development, they took an incredibly bold decision to exclude the Portals entirely from the game, which sounds insane on the surface, but was going to be replaced with another innovative gameplay mechanic, which Valve titled F-Stop. This was a mechanic all based on perspective and angles, basically boiling down to an idea where items in the foreground could be pulled further away and be replaced with the same item that's genuinely smaller in scale, and vice versa. This was eventually scrapped, as the complete removal of portals disappointed playtesters, but the idea itself has been used since, most prominently in the game Superliminal. When entering the game, we can pretty much immediately see that both the scale and ambition has been cranked up majorly this time. It's an excellent setup, creating a mirror of the events in the first game, but this time launching us to an unspecified point in the future, with the help of cryo-freezing. You have been in suspension for 99999 Nine, nine. Hello? Anyone in there? The intercom obviously has an error, but we can assume by the repetition of the number 9 that we've most likely been taken to a point so far ahead of anything in this Half-Life Portal universe. We then get introduced to Wheatley, excellently performed by Stephen Merchant. Most test subjects do experience some uh, cognitive deterioration after a few months in suspension. Now you've been under for quite a lot longer, and it's not out of the question that you might have a very minor case 
of serious brain damage. If there's any XFM listeners watching this video who haven't played Portal 2, it's literally Stephen Merchant doing Stephen Merchant, and it's great. I won't deny that Wheatley won't be to everyone's tastes, and having him be your ally throughout the first half of your journey could end up annoying some people, but I think it's just so well done. The writing and performance somehow elevate this character above GLaDOS for me personally. Just tell me, just say yes. Okay, what you're doing there is jumping. Uh, you just, you just jumped. But never mind, say apple. Apple. Okay, you know what? That's close enough. We then get thrown into what I think may be Portal 2's biggest pitfall. I mean, I think the game's a masterpiece just like the first, but presumably due to the increased resources and the extended length of the game, there's a much heavier emphasis on the narrative and set pieces. This first one which plays out is still majorly impressive, but the fact is, this game's definitely had the Half-Life 2 treatment. Half-Life 1 and Portal 1 were almost solely focused on gameplay, with the narrative being present, but pretty much being entirely ignorable if the player chooses. There's several several instances throughout the game where you simply won't be able to progress until someone's finished talking, which of course gives you more room to breathe, take in the atmosphere and the narrative, but also comes at the downside of feeling stunted at points. And that's not something inherently exclusive to this game. I've always had the mindset that video games should be primarily interactive, which is why even games like MGS4 piss me off on occasion. The format of a video game is unique because of the interactivity. If you're taking that away, I might as well be watching some animated film on Netflix. I do find it quite genius though how they weave this narrative into the gameplay. It's almost like they have the exact same mindset with the steady progression in the previous game. Literally, right after we hop out the wreckage of our room, we end up back at the start of the first game, taking things full circle and conveying the situation without any kind of forced exposition. We can see from the environment alone that Aperture Science has been completely forgotten and as a result looks on the brink of collapse. Glass and rubble lay around everywhere, vines hang off walls, there's moss growing out of the ground, and the dirty walls and ceilings are obviously even more wrecked. I've always thought this first section is quite ballsy in terms of a sequel, as despite the new coat of paint in your surroundings, and of course the absence of GLaDOS, you were quite literally repeating the same chambers from the first game, just with slight variations, some of which permeate for the rest of the game. There's slight changes like in this cube puzzle, where you now press the buttons to activate the portal, instead of it going on a rotation, but it's clear Valve knew there were going to be a lot of returning players on top of new players, so in turn introduce new elements, like the screen surrounding the elevators, not only just looking nice, but also having some lore tidbits, like in this Animal King takeover one, where we can clearly see Aperture eventually progress to the point where they were supported by several countries, perhaps giving them funding on their experiments. But the best change here is that we get access to the portal gun much quicker, and I mean both the blue and orange portals. Having the automatic orange portals for a while doesn't feel that great, and I wish I had even more control earlier on, but once again you've got to think about it from a developer's perspective. They need to take into account all players, not just experienced ones. Let's pay attention to the sound design in these sections, as I think it's excellent at conveying the scenario we've been thrust into. Whereas Portal 1 had almost complete silence in the occasional ambient track, we now frequently hear sounds akin to a woodland, further reinforcing just how broken down and different Aperture is since we were last here. There are some genuinely new tests in between the ones we've already seen, but they pretty much serve the exact same purpose. One's focused on timing, one's focused on momentum. It's more of the same. But even if this was how the game played out in its entirety, it'd still be pretty damn good. The biggest changes occur after we stumble across the remains of GLaDOS, which is led up to perfectly. Okay, ready? One. Catch me, catch me out. Wheatley takes us through a secret passage, allowing us to bypass all the tests, and eventually we end up reaching GLaDOS's chamber. As you could guess, things could only go wrong here, with us accidentally powering up GLaDOS, resulting in what we initially assume is Wheatley's death, as well as getting thrown back down into Aperture. It's these kinds of moments which highlight the step up from the previous game. It was very rare in the first game to get anything akin to a cutscene, with the cake at the end perhaps being the only proper example. I'm glad we do get these opportunities, however, as some of the spectacles which are showcased are still damn impressive by today's standards, and it also obviously brings us further into the narrative, which was clearly more of a priority in this game. Upon acquiring the second half of the portal gun, we once again go through the motions, but the dialogue delivered by GLaDOS here is just so unbelievably great. Here come the test results. You are a horrible person. 
That's what it says. A horrible person. We weren't even testing for that. Most people emerge from suspension terribly undernourished. I want to congratulate you on beating the odds and somehow managing to pack on a few pounds. You are navigating these test chambers faster than I can build them. So feel free to slow down and do whatever it is you do when you're not destroying this facility. It's quite a rare instance when a game makes me genuinely laugh. They can make me chuckle or do that stupid nose exhale at what's supposed to be a quirky moment. But most of the time, comedy seems to fall flat in games for me, opting for some really lame charm, typically with an emphasis on making the player feel smart, as opposed to out and out laughs. Portal is one of the few games that actually makes me laugh consistently every time I play it. Oh no. Yes, hello, no, we're not stopping. Don't make eye contact, whatever you do. No, thanks, we're good. Appreciate it. The extremes GLaDOS goes to just to make you feel stupid and horrible is so funny to me, and is made even funnier because of her deadpan delivery. And with GLaDOS coming back to life, knowing full well that you literally killed her, she's as bitter as she's ever been. Here's an interesting fact. You're not breathing real air. It's too expensive to pump this far down. We just take carbon dioxide out of a room, freshen it up a little, and pump it back in, so you'll be breathing the same room full of air for the rest of your life. I thought that was interesting. As for the changes I mentioned, these basically come in the form of brand new, more stylish equipment, which pretty much serves the exact same function. The laser, for example, completely replaces the energy balls, presumably to spice up the overall gameplay for those who played the first. The laser not only looks great, of course, but for me was much more effective and efficient to actually puzzle solve with. So the laser effectively is very similar to the energy ball, right? Like it goes in one, uh, and you want it, like it goes in over here, and you want it to go to the receptacle over there. Uh, the big advantage here is that the, the, the reaction is instant. So if the player got the solution or not, it's instantaneous. You don't, you don't have to have situations where you place the exit portal, and now you have to wait for the ball to go all the way across the level and see if it lines up or not. This way, it just instantly does it. A new cube gets introduced as the primary way of controlling these beams, letting you point them in any horizontal direction. It's in these moments where some genuinely new challenges start to be thrown upon us. As with the energy balls, it was all about directing it with your portals, whereas here we actually have to take our own physical position into account. I'm not as familiar with Portal 2 as I am the first game, so I was pleasantly surprised by both some of the puzzles which completely stumped me, although these occurred more towards the end of the game, and some new additions which are so great, I forgot they were completely absent from the first game, one of my favourites being the reactive soundtrack, usually kicking up in intensity when flying through the air. There's also occasions this will happen when solving puzzles, giving you an extra audible implication that you're getting closer to completion. I was worried about this game falling into the horrible trap of being self-referential. Portal was pretty much a meme generator at the time, so trying to forcefully cram those things into this new game would have just looked lame. But every time you see something you remember from the last game, it's always done for a specific reason. The cake in the companion cube I thought would be the main concerns, but they thankfully don't overdo it. To my knowledge, the cake only gets mentioned passingly one time, if at all, and the companion cube is also used once, and is made even better by the scenario which takes place, with GLaDOS frying the cube several times just to tear your heart out. Oh, did I accidentally fizzle that before you could complete the test? Oh, no, I fizzled that one too. I think that one was about to say, I love you. They are sentient, of course. We just have a lot of them. As you may have noticed, this first section of the game has been primarily comparisons, as for the most part, that's all I can really do. Nothing we see here is anything I haven't already mentioned, which is almost exactly what you want from this game, as it also means it's got that exact same satisfying progression, elevating in difficulty and complexity as new concepts are presented. Well, I just said that, but there is also a brand new addition which gets introduced here, which is the light bridge. It is literally just a bridge, but the way it functions becomes rather interesting when introduced 
producing the portals. As long as you've got a portal on the source, you can literally put this thing anywhere. It does matter what axis it's on. As if it's pointing up, placing another portal on the ground will also only shoot it vertically. These present more of an actual threat, as there's lots of instances where you'll need to use these to bypass lethal bodies of toxic water, making you actually think carefully, and punishing those who are simply trying to rush forward. If you use the bridge cleverly in Chamber 17 as well, I'd say you get easily one of the most eerie moments in a game I've experienced, period. The room's weird enough, but approaching closer to the scrawlings on the wall, we can hear this garbled and bizarre talking. Many people have presumed this to be Doug Ratman, and have tried to analyse what this dialogue actually means. Although, till this day, I don't think there's ever been a concrete answer to what the deal is here. What's going on? Who turned off the lights? Hey, buddy! I'm speaking in an accent that is beyond her range of hearing! Look, Metal Ball, I can hear you. Run! I don't need to do the voice! Run! <laughs> Wheatley eventually ends up saving us, taking us to a really nice set piece where we attempt to escape GLaDOS. Something that's really good here is the music, which is pretty much consistent throughout the entire game. Although I will say, it's got a considerably different tone, and more techno-focused, fast-paced rhythms. It fits very well for this game, considering that Portal 2 does push more in the direction of being overtly funny, quirky, and more intense. But in my personal opinion, I think the atmosphere of the first game will always be unparalleled. The way music was used in that game was utterly perfect. Every track had its own individual impact, and was definitely more foreboding and mysterious. A primary reason for this change is that composer Kelly Bailey had left Valve during the game's development. He wasn't just responsible for most of the Portal soundtrack, but also the entire Half-Life series. He was fully replaced by Mike Muraski, who also contributed some tracks to the first game. And obviously, it's not a competition. These are two incredibly accomplished artists, with two different styles of creating music. But I think it's appropriate to say that Bailey's unique sound is noticeably absent from the second game. I do have to say though, this is where we start going into the territory that I'm kind of conflicted on. You have this good setup and payoff while you and Wheatley are behind the scenes, enacting a plan to cut off all of GLaDOS's offences, like the turrets and neurotoxin. But this is where the game starts to transition away from what Portal actually was, a puzzle game. There's areas I have considerable issues with, like when you need to cut off the neurotoxin. There's no actual puzzle, which is sort of what the games have accustomed me to look out for. I was wandering around for ages is completely lost in this tiny section, until I finally noticed that there were some white panels way off in the distance that can be used to slice off the connecting tubes. The one thing I can say about this switched up design is that it's at least trying to do something new. I'm sure the developers heavily contemplated the possibility of the gameplay going stale this time round, so injected these set pieces and experiential pieces instead of just raw puzzle solving. The experiment is admirable, but oftentimes simply results in you annoyingly looking around for a point to shoot to. There's no real challenge. It's just navigation. This is primarily shown in the old Aperture Science segment, which occurs after we give control over to Wheatley, where he gets overcome with evil, turning GLaDOS into a potato, and shooting you an incredible distance down the facility. I love the intro to this segment, getting about a minute's worth of pure fooling, while GLaDOS basically calls you an idiot. He's the product of the greatest minds of a generation, working together with the express purpose of building the dumbest moron who ever lived. And you just put him in charge of the entire facility. Good, that's still working. It reminds me of the Snake Eater ladder, giving us room to breathe. After several quite intense scenarios, the environments in this area are fantastic, having an amazing sense of scale, and immaculately detailed sections that I could stare at for absolutely ages. You really get the feeling that this was once a place filled with avid scientists and insane experiments, all forgotten with time. And the overall progression in this section I see as great in terms of the narrative, but hit and miss when it comes to the gameplay. We're once again not particularly focused on solving puzzles outright, but more focused on navigating our way upwards to escape. The story in this section completely fleshes out the background of Aperture Science, primarily done through the voice recordings delivered by Cave Johnson, voiced by J.K. Simmons. Oh, in case you got covered in that repulsion gel, here's some advice the lab boys gave me. 
do not get covered in the repulsion gym. I don't know if I'm biased just because it's J.K. Simmons, but I think the storyline that ensues is one that's incredibly tight and easy to understand on the surface, but becomes infinitely more complex when paying close attention to your surroundings. Through these voice recordings, which progress forward in time as you elevate yourself up, we discover the sad fate of Aperture's founder, purchasing an abandoned salt mine in 1943, going into competition with Black Mesa, and developing things like the Blue Repulsion Gel, a weighted storage cube, and a 1500 megawatt super colliding super button. These are all things we actually see as we progress, and I'll talk about those in a sec. As time went on, Cave Johnson was put under fire because of things like Aperture's financial instability, and also a number of missing astronauts, which were presumed dead due to testing. You might know us as a vital participant in the 1968 Senate hearings on missing astronauts, and you've most likely used one of the many products we invented, but that other people have somehow managed to steal from us. Black Mesa can eat my bankrupt- Sir, the testing? Right. His ultimate downfall came with further experimentation with the gels, creating an orange propulsion gel and a white conversion gel. It was this conversion gel that was actually made up of moon rocks, an incredibly poisonous substance, which would eventually lead to Cave Johnson's health swiftly declining, with his last wish being that Aperture continues on, with his assistant Carolyn taking over as the head. And guess what? Ground up moon rocks are pure poison. I am deathly ill. Brain mapping. Artificial intelligence. We should have been working on it 30 years ago. I will say this, and I'm going to say it on tape so everybody hears it a hundred times a day. If I die before you people can pour me into a computer, I want Carolyn to run this place. <coughs> now she'll argue. She'll say she can't. She's modest like that, but you make her. <coughs> Hell, put her in my computer, I don't care. This story is interesting enough, being wonderfully delivered and excellently paced throughout this section. The revelations that come from this are quite substantial and also exciting. The slow reveal of Carolyn actually being GLaDOS's human form is set up to be so intriguing, with different pieces of the puzzle emerging over time. There's also tons of little lore tidbits hidden amongst here, which I'm sure many people have taken a deep dive in, but it's primarily the foundation and downfall of Aperture, which is the ultimate takeaway. As for the new mechanics, which get introduced here, I think they're all excellent and expand on ideas which were merely hinted at previously. The gels clearly switch up the gameplay the most, having three separate types which have radically different effects. The blue one gives you an extra high jump, being used frequently to either reach a higher position or to gain even further momentum while bunny hopping from point to point. The orange one increases the speed of your movement, allowing you to propel yourself forward at a much higher speed, and can also be used alongside the blue gel to launch yourself forward and upwards. And finally, the white gel can be spread around any surface, which in turn will then mean you can now place a portal down, as long as the area is big enough. These are all introduced at a slow and manageable pace, primarily having you get to grips with the blue gel first, before then introducing the second two later on. There's particular details I really like in this section, which do carry across to the rest of the game, such as the frequently changing loading screens, used very effectively in this part to convey the different time periods of Aperture Science. This is also used unexpectedly later on, when we eventually end up back under Wheatley's control. There's there's also tons of details you can notice around the environment, some of which are in plain sight, and others which are hidden behind secret walls and passages, letting us discover more elements in relation to the game's lore, as well as getting a glimpse at who we can suspect is GLaDOS, or rather Carolyn. I will stand by the fact that I'm not the biggest fan of how these levels are laid out though. I've already mentioned the more open design actually ends up taking away from the puzzle solving gameplay, but funny enough, the design choice of having these large sections was apparently done to make the player more creative with their actions. and. And I simply don't understand this, as unlike in the normal test chambers where you can quite literally experiment with the entire room, there's very few surfaces you can actually place portals on here, making your path forward infinitely more obvious. And I'll also stand by the fact there's particular moments like this with the conversion gel which I really didn't like. I feel like there's too much ambiguity in how you're actually supposed to progress, which is something the normal chambers, despite not being too difficult, never had a problem with. This is quite clearly my opinion, so take it how you want. I just personally feel that a franchise like Portal thrives when working off its good mechanics, and not when it's just focused on progressing forward. And I mean, this example is the worst of the worst. We get a great puzzle using portals, gels, and momentum, but when we reach the end, we see some random conversion gel falling from a pipe. Now, it's not made at all clear where the actual exit is supposed to be, and looking around the area, there's several places which could plausibly be an exit, but are simply impossible to get to. The way you progress here isn't to connect all the pieces together to fling yourself 
off into a new area. But instead, just look through this tight gap that the conversion gel's falling out of, and notice this tiny slither of white that you need to place your portal on. The solution was obvious, but was covered up by the environment, not creating a satisfying moment when I finally discover what to do, but simply annoyance that this was the only way to progress. After this though, we're back to test chambers, this time being curated by Wheatley. Hey, it is great seeing you guys again. Seriously, um, it turns out I'm a little bit short on test subjects right now, so this works out perfect. We get introduced to a couple new things, like these turret cubes, which function the same as normal cubes, but simply convey Wheatley's twisted mindset, trying to smash things together to see if they'll work. This also translates to a lot of these levels' layouts, still obviously functioning in a cohesive and passable manner, but being very clearly made up of several pre-existing tests, which Wheatley admits himself. Yeah, made this test myself out of smaller tests that I found lying around. Jammed them all together. Buttons, got funnels, bottomless pits are involved. It's got it all. It's got it all. I have to dynamite. Although, because of this unconventional style in the layouts, some new things like the excursion funnels are introduced, levitating you in the air and pushing you in a certain direction. These can often be reversed by holding down a button, turning the beam orange to signify this. I've always liked elements like this in these games, as these are the things that more frequently stump me, as you've not only got to consider where this beam will actually take you when going forward, but also if you'll need to go backwards and head through your portals to solve the test. Throughout these chambers, all of your skills are tested, and I mean all of them. It's incredibly well done how they somehow managed to weave all these different elements together while still feeling unconvoluted. Remember, that's what I think is the key to these games. Almost having that feeling when entering a room that you know what to do, and then gradually whittling down your solutions until you find the right one. Just like the first game, the final chapter, the part where he kills you, is basically one big set piece. It's purely about the excitement of escaping from Wheatley and heading forward in hopes to shut him down. But that's obviously fine, especially with some of the unbelievable moments we witness in this part. Gigantic test chambers being smashed into each other, huge walls of spikes being constantly thrown at you, and just the visuals in some of these parts are drop dead amazing. But we eventually end up reaching Wheatley, with a fairly similar boss fight to the first game, but with some added elements to spice things up. We now need to use our portals more effectively, as this time we're getting shot at with bombs, as opposed to the rockets which you could always gauge the direction of. Wheatley will have a constant guard up too, which you'll need to frequently adapt to as the fight progresses, as he'll actively react to where you've previously been targeting him. And as opposed to burning the moral cores like we did in the GLaDOS fight, we're now given the cores back to be placed on Wheatley, which do require some consideration to acquire, with GLaDOS handing you these from all different directions. The ending is absolutely insane though, with the entire facility falling apart, a hole gets made in the ceiling, revealing the moon, which of course, due to our knowledge of the usage of moon rocks in the conversion gel, means that we can place a portal on the actual moon. <laughs> I can pull myself in! I can still fix this! I already fixed it. And you are not coming back. Oh no! Change your plans! Hold on to me! Tighter! Ah! It's insane. I have no idea how our human character Chell can actually survive this, but I mean, it doesn't really matter, does it? Seeing Wheatley get thrown off into space and actually having GLaDOS save us is an extremely satisfying end to our journey. Once again, closing things out with a song as we make our way upwards and out of the facility. <laughs> Unlike the Left 4 Dead and Half-Life games, I don't think Portal really needs another sequel. It's not that I wouldn't want one, but this ending does feel very finite. It's the first time we've actually been let loose into the outside world, without being dragged back in. And in a narrative sense, all loose ends have now been firmly wrapped up. Any remaining questions are most likely always going to be left unanswered, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, as it leaves more room for creative thought, and is one of the key reasons that Portal is still discussed to this day. There was also a cooperative mode this time round, which for a game like Portal was a 
fantastic idea. Of course, the best way to play this is by coordinating with a friend, although you can still play with a random person online if you want to. I don't want to talk at length about the co-op mode, but it is great and definitely worth experiencing after you finish the main game. They don't skimp on any of these test chambers. There's some in here that due to the cooperative nature of these levels designs, that presents some of the most challenging and satisfying tests to solve in the entire series in my opinion. It's clear there was a distinct push towards this part of the game in particular, with the cover art of this game only featuring the two characters we play as here, Atlas and Peabody. I love these characters' designs, the emotes they can perform, and the fact that unlike something like Still Alive, everything here is fully accompanied by GLaDOS. It would have been easy to make this a tacked-on feature, but Valve once again proves that if they're gonna try something, they'll give it their all. That being said, there are some bad precedents which are set here though, sort of like a foreshadowing to what many consider to be Valve's downfall. There's a tab called Robot Enrichment, which is where you can customise both characters to appear different in co-op gameplay. The only problem is, these aren't unlockables, but microtransactions. This is a trend that was becoming increasingly common around this time period, and it's a shame that Valve took part in this, and eventually ended up creating some of the most awful and money-hungry practices I've ever witnessed a game company do. They aren't too bad in this game, but I think that's more to do with the fact that they don't really work with a game like Portal. You're only ever playing with one other person, which is most likely going to be your friend, so you're not really going to be able to show off these skins to anyone, and can't even look at them yourself most of the time because you're in first person. Although I've never really understood the idea of these paid for items anyway. The only reason I used to buy things like this was in hope to profit off them. So Valve basically turned me on to gambling for a while. As a kid. <laughs> Anyways, that's Portal, and I can confidently say that after analysing these games more up close, they definitely still hold up as some of the finest creations in gaming history. The gameplay is truly innovative and groundbreaking, the visuals are very distinct, and have that stylized appearance that will likely never make them appear truly dated. The story and characters are genuinely interesting, and present a satisfying and fascinating narrative, both on the surface and when looking deeper into it. It's yet another series created by Valve which feels well, feels so much like what Valve used to be. True game changers, and the type of series that's never going to be forgotten. I wish I could take it all back. I honestly do. I honestly do wish I could take it all back. And not just because I'm stranded in space. I'm in space. I know you are, mate. Yeah, we're both in space. Space! Anyway, you know, if I was ever to see her again, do you know what I'd say? I'm in space. I'd say, I'm sorry. Sincerely. I am sorry I was bossy and monstrous. And I am genuinely sorry. I'm in space. The end.